Hello, I'm Dr. Jeannie Ramirez Mather. I'm a certified elementary, middle school, and secondary teacher and a retired college professor. When I was young, we had no books in our house, which may explain why I am so passionate about the importance of children's literature and recognize its ability to build bridges. Why should we use children's literature? Well, all ages, preschool through adults, enjoy being read to or enjoy reading a children's book. Children's literature can range from picture books to novels. It can be fictional or informational. It is often easier to relate to a character in a story than to be told about an event, fact, or person. It can expose the reader to different worldviews and cultures. It can provide a new perspective to historical events. It tends to be a less threatening way to present old problems and new problems. It can stimulate emotions and help develop empathy. It can provide new perspectives on issues important to children and young adults. Now, what kind of issues do you think are important to children and young adults? Things like bullying, abuse, trauma, health issues, divorce, adoption, immigration, family, rights and activism, poverty, class, historical inaccuracies, bias in terms of religion, gender, ableism, etc or racism. Because of the limited amount of time I have, I'm going to concentrate on the last two issues of bias and racism. To do that, you need to understand my definition of multicultural. So my definition includes diversity in race, culture, language, religion, sexual orientation, gender, differently abled, ageism, and it goes on. As you can see, I have a very broad definition of multicultural. And I hope that after this session, perhaps your definition of multiculturalism will have expanded. Who should be introduced to multicultural issues? Some people think that, well, minorities primarily need to be exposed to minority role models, minority issues, et cetera. And then while it is true they do need to be exposed, actually everyone needs to be exposed to multicultural literature, not just minorities. It's easy to see how Children's literature can be used in the elementary school, but it can be used in virtually any subject area at any level, middle school, high school, college, adults. It can be used to highlight different cultures through the contributions of women and minorities in math, science, social studies. We could look at inventors, activists, historical figures. We can use it in language arts, talking about writers or poets. We can use it in music, physical education, and even foreign language. So for example, to teach or introduce a new language in the elementary school, we could look at Hello World, readings in 42 languages around the globe, a sign language alphabet hand signs, Petit Rouge, a Cajun Red Riding Hood, which introduces both Cajun and French words. Carmen Learns English is about a little Hispanic girl who goes to school and needs to learn English. There is a Word document that I will make available, which includes a list of the book titles I will be talking about today, but it will include some additional titles as well. Um, these books that I talk about today and that are listed will show insights into international issues, African American culture, Hispanic cultures, Native American cultures, Asian and Asian Pacific Islanders, women's issues, LBGTQ, and a number of these books overlap into other categories, so it's not just one or the other. Uh, my document will also include some recommended websites so you can find some additional children's literature. What would I hope that you get out of this session? I hope that you'll be able to identify several reasons for using children's literature, uh, that you recognize the wide range that the term diversity may represent, that you become more familiar with some of the many books highlighting important diversity issues, that you learn new information about minority contributions. And I'd like for you to try and think how the books can be utilized beyond the obvious topic. So for example, a story might be about a non-English speaking student like Carmen and Carmen learns English and how she is not being accepted by her classmates and the problems associated with language acquisition. While the story may relate specifically to Hispanic culture, it really relates to any child feeling they don't fit in or are not accepted for whatever reason. I come from a military family, so I know that feeling very well, as do most children of military families, minority children 
autistic children, deaf children, and many more. So many books, so little time. I will give a brief synopsis of some, but not all of the titles that I am including. Um, so get ready, let's start. Some general examples. The Color of Us showcases the many shades of skin, not just black, white, or brown. Skin may be the color of cinnamon, peanut butter, chocolate, honey, or even coffee. This book helps readers associate positive things with skin color and gives an opportunity to perhaps introduce multicultural crayons, pencils, or markers. Anti-Racist Baby presents nine suggestions for raising an anti-racist child. While it was designed with African-American children in mind, it applies to all children. As he, the author says, anti-racist baby is bred, not born. And a line I particularly like is, if you claim to be colorblind, you deny what's right in front of you. This is a particular pet peeve of mine. When people tell me they are colorblind, I think, I don't want you to be colorblind. I'm proud of my color. All I want is for you to see it, recognize it, appreciate it, and not use it against me. Marisol McDonald doesn't match. Uh, is a biracial Peruvian Scottish American girl who likes peanut butter and jelly burritos, polka dots and stripes worn together, and overall does not fit into what other people think she should like or do. She tries to change, but eventually she decides she likes her mismatched self. The author really is a biracial Peruvian Scottish American, and this happens to be a bilingual Spanish book. If the world were a village, collapses the seven plus billion people in the world to a village of a hundred and looks at how many people would speak Chinese, Hindi, English, etc. How many would be able to read and write? How many would have fresh water, etc.? It helps the reader put information into perspective and see what Americans may take for granted or erroneously assume about others. People helps to highlight the wide range of differences in the world population in a fun, unusual, informative way, and shares the joy in the uniqueness of each individual. Terrible Things is not a fun book. It is a story about animals who are living happily in their community when the terrible things appear and start capturing animals, one species at a time, and taking them away. None of the remaining animals stand up for the victims, until soon no animals are left except one little rabbit who had hidden. The book illustrates the need to stand up for what is right, even if others don't, and implies the power we would have if we all stood up together. Sammy in the Time of Troubles is also not a fun book, but it is a powerful, insightful story of a child growing up in Beirut, wartime Beirut. The hiding in a basement to avoid the bombings, the lack of food, the occasional foray into the streets to see new devastation. Children growing up in relative peace will have their eyes open to what some children suffer. On a totally different note, Vinnie and Abraham is based on the true story of Vinnie Ream, one of the first young females to work for the US post office and the youngest artist and first woman to receive a commission from the US government. Her sculpture of Abraham Lincoln still stands today in the US Capitol. Most of the story is set during the Civil War and shows the gender bias of the time. Nettie's trip south was inspired by the author's great-grandmother's diary of her trip to the south in 1859. The story features a young girl who witnesses firsthand what it is like to live and be sold as a slave. It's a very powerful, poignant picture book. Warriors Don't Cry has the author telling her story of being one of nine teenagers who integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. The cruelty she faced, the danger dodging lighted sticks of dynamite and having acid thrown into her face is a true story that will make young adults and older readers aware of the danger and courage fighting for integration involved and still involves. Separate is Never Equal follows the story of a young Hispanic girl as she enters school in California only to learn she must go to the Mexican school and the years fighting the system her family undertook to change the law. Finally, in 1947, her case resulted in the striking down of segregation in California schools and set a precedent that seven years later would be used in Brown versus Board of Education, ending segregation in all schools across America. 
this book strikes home for me as my father had to go to a Mexican school in Texas. Farewell to Manzanar is the true story of a Japanese family imprisoned at Manzanar during World War II. The parents who had been in America for 30 years were forbidden by law from becoming American citizens. Thus they, together with their American born children were forcibly removed from their homes and taken to a camp in the California desert. Of the 10,000 held in the camp, two thirds were US citizens. Deaf culture A to Z is a little more lighthearted. It's a wonderful ABC book, which includes an explanation of an element of deaf culture for each finger spelled letter. For example, B is for bed vibrator, used to awaken deaf individuals as a traditional alarm clock is not effective. Encounter is a historical fiction set in 1492 when Christopher Columbus landed on the island of San Salvador and encountered the Teano Indians. It is told from a young Teano boy's point of view and how he tried to warn his people against welcoming the strangers who he feared, who seemed more interested in gold than friendship. It exposes the destruction of the Teano people and their culture by the colonizers. Some more favorites, People of Peace presents 40 inspiring icons of the 20th century, some well-known, others of lesser renown, who left a lasting mark on the movement towards peace in the world. Listen to the Wind, the story of Dr. Greg and Three Cups of Tea, is the story of a male United States nurse who helped build over 50 schools in Pakistan and Afghanistan, raised money through pennies for peace, and changed the lives of many, many people. Passage to Freedom, the Sugihara story, is based on the true story of the author's father, who was a Japanese diplomat in Lithuania in 1940, who helped thousands of Jews escape the country in direct defiance of the Japanese government's orders and the ramifications for him and his family. Shifting to an international view, uh, Akira to Zoltan and Amelia to Zora, both by Chin Li, discuss 26 men and 26 women respectively who changed the world. Brothers in Hope is the story of the lost boys of the Sudan. Groups of young boys with no adults to help walked hundreds of miles from Sudan to Ethiopia and eventually Kenya to escape the war and to seek safety. In particular, it follows the arduous trip through the eyes of one of the eight-year-olds. For the right to learn, tells the story of Malala's perseverance to get an education in a country that prohibited her from getting one and the cost of that perseverance. It also shows the wide impact one individual, one teenager can have. Escape to Freedom relates the widely different and dangerous stories of young refugees from 10 different countries who risked their lives trying to escape their home countries to get to the United States. Diego, is the story of Diego Rivera, the world famous Mexican muralist, as told through a picture book. Note that this children's book, like so many others I will talk about or have talked about today, includes an afterword with greater detail about the subject of the story. A thousand and One Inventions and Awesome Facts from Muslim Civilization, um, a play on words, if you will, of A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, published by National Geographic, does a wonderful job of introducing you to amazing inventions and facts about the Muslim culture. Jars of Hope is obviously about a woman who helped save 2,500 children during the Holocaust. The Underground Reporters uh, deals with Czechoslovakian teenagers who were trying to defy the Nazis. The Grand Mosque of Paris, self-explanatory, a story of how Muslims rescued Jews during the Holocaust, but they also rescued allies. And this was when Paris was under siege. Notice that the illustrations in the book are amazing, just gorgeous. Shifting to looking at women, there are a number of excellent books about women. You may not have heard of Molly Pitcher. Um, I'm not sure you've heard of Molly Hayes, but 
This book tells the story of Molly Hayes, who during the American Revolutionary War went from carrying water to wounded soldiers while dodging gunfire to serving as a soldier firing a cannon at the enemy. Her bravery and contributions were recognized by General George Washington, who made her a sergeant in the Continental Army. Nurse Soldier Spy, the story of Sarah Edmonds, tells the amazingly true story of 19-year-old Sarah Edmonds, who disguised herself as a boy enlisted in the U Union Army and served as a soldier, nurse, and spy during the Civil War. There are many books at various levels about Sarah. Shooting for the Moon, Amazing Life and Times of Annie Oakley. You would be amazed at her story. Let me just give you that. Lizzie Murphy, Queen of Baseball, was the first woman to play in a major league exhibition game and the first person to play on both the National and American League's all-star teams. Her professional baseball career was 1918 to 1935. Particularly interesting, she refused to play unless she was paid the same as her male teammates. She was such an amazing player and a draw for spectators that she was indeed paid the same amount as the men and her teammates fully supported her. Cool Women is a book highlighting 50 amazing women through the ages and from all around the world. I Descent is just one of many books about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her amazing life and contributions. Let us shift to um, African Americans. There are many, many, many books about African Americans. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Henry's Freedom Box is a true story of how Henry Brown shipped himself to freedom in a wooden crate. Amos Fortune is a historical fiction, follows the story of Atman, son of a king of the Atmunsi tribe in Africa. It follows his capture, his enslavement, his mission to buy his freedom, which he was finally able to do at the age of 60. And it follows him till his death years later. Up from the Ashes by Hannibal Johnson is one of several books he's written about the Tulsa race riots, which now is referred to as Tulsa Massacre. Uh, if you're not familiar with Black Wall Street and the Tulsa race riots, you will find this very informative. Up with the Ashes is a picture book about it, but it goes through. There are other books written at higher levels. Claudette Colvin was a teenage girl in 1955, and this incident happens nine months before Rosa Parks' bus incident, who refused to give up her seat to a white woman on a segregated bus in Alabama and was arrested. When she was released later, she was not applauded by her peers or her community. She was shunned by her peers and dismissed by her community. Much Months later, she was able to testify in the Rosa Parks bus case. The Color of Culture by Mona Lake Jones, and she has a second volume out, is a wonderful book of poetry and powerful one-liners. I'd like to quote one from page 37. Sometimes it's hard to pretend you're not aware that people wish you weren't there, quote. I can relate to this. There have been many times I have felt that way. And I would venture to say every minority has felt that way at some point. And think about being a small child in a classroom thinking that way. Looking at Asians and Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, in particular, let's look at 16 years and 16 seconds. This is the inspirational true story of Sammy Lee, a Korean American who overcame discrimination to realize both his father's desire that he become a doctor and his own personal dream of becoming an Olympic champion diver. The Name Jar is the story of a young Korean girl who moves to a new town and no one can pronounce her name, which is spelled U-N-H-E-I and is pronounced Yunhe. So she assumes she needs to get a new name. So she lets her classmates put names in a jar for her to choose from, but ultimately she decides to keep her name. Names really are important, and we should not force anglicized names on individuals just because we may struggle with pronouncing their given names. We ask them to learn an entire new language. The least we can do is learn how to pronounce their name. So just keep trying. Hispanic culture, 
There are a number of bilingual books, for example, Family Pictures, Cuadros de Familia. Um, there are books relating to the folkloric of the skirt. This is a story of Miata, a young girl who takes her folkloric skirt, which she's supposed to dance in in a few days. She takes it to school and forgets it on the bus. It was particularly special skirt as it was her mother's skirt when her mother was a child in Mexico. The story is looking at the line, will she find a way to rescue her skirt and will she be able to do it in time? The story focuses on family ties, friendship and ethnic pride. Journey of the Sparrows follows three young Hispanics who illegally enter the US to get away from the violence in San Salvador where their father and brother-in-law were murdered. And they would have been murdered too if they had, hadn't hidden and escaped. It starts with the youth being nailed into a crate in the back of the truck, traveling from the border to Chicago in dead of winter and the trials and tribulations that follow. While I do not endorse illegal immigration, I do think it is important to understand why some people risk their lives to do it and some of the problems they suffer even after they cross the border. Highlighting Native Americans, <clears throat> excuse me, Code Talker, a novel about the Navajo Marines of World War II is an excellent book. The Great American Bunyan Derby is more of a middle school book. It tells the 1928 story of Andy Payne, part Cherokee. He was a farm boy from Oklahoma. It tells of his entrance and competition in the first annual international transcontinental foot race. Yes, I said foot race. The over 3,400 mile race from California to New York uh, later became referred to as the Great Bunyan Derby for obvious reasons. Rough Faced Girl is a Native American Cinderella story. Uh, excellent pictures, well done text. The interesting thing is that almost every culture in the world has some form of a Cinderella story. LGBTQ obviously is a sensitive topic, so you have to be aware of how accepting it is to present and where and when, how old the children are, et cetera. One book that I particularly like is Entango Makes Three. It's a true story about two penguins that live in the Central Park Zoo in New York. And these two male penguins have bonded and have formed a family unit. And they swim together and they eat together, that kind of thing. And the zookeeper has noticed this. He's also noticed that when the penguins gather to mate and to lay eggs that Roy and Silo form an egg and they form a nest. They don't have an egg, so they don't really understand eggs. So they find a bigger rock and they stick in the middle of the nest and they sit on it like all the other penguins are sitting on their eggs. And they wait and wait and wait, tending to this rock. And while the other penguins are able to hatch their eggs, Roy and Silo obviously can't hatch a rock. So the zookeeper notices that one of the couples has been able to lay in the past two eggs, but it has never been able to successfully hatch two eggs. It can only hatch one. So when this couple lays two eggs, the zookeeper takes one of them and gives it to Roy and Silo, who are extremely happy they put it in their nest, they tend to it. So one of them is always on top of the egg while one of them is swimming and eating, the other one is tending the egg and then they switch out. They eventually do hatch the egg. It's a little female penguin, Tango. And they take very good care of her. They raise her up to be a penguin. They teach her how to swim and how to eat and how to act and all those kinds of things. It's a really sweet story um, in a, a gentle way to get into this idea of different kinds of families. In the handout that you will have available, I've included some websites. I didn't want you to have to try to copy those all down. And you will be able to find additional titles dealing with Asian Americans, LBGTQ, diversity in general, immigrants, and I did want to point out Learning for Justice, which was formerly 
called Teaching Tolerance. Some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, while I loved the publication, I was uncomfortable with the idea of teaching tolerance. Tolerance implies a negativity, and apparently they had enough responses similar to mine that they did indeed change the name to Learning for Justice, which I think is much better. They have a wonderful home website with lots of teaching resources, and then in particular, they have a web page for teaching children's literature. Classroom Spice will be my last suggestion. I'm a little biased in this because I happen to be its editor. It is a multicultural interdisciplinary newsletter published here through the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma. It includes articles relating to diversity, a wide range of diversity, and each issue has a review of multicultural children's literature. So I hope, in closing, I'd like to say, I hope I introduced you to a few titles that you are now interested in and purchasing or reading. But I hope you also gain some new ideas for utilizing children's literature to build bridges. I hope you also will look around the world where you live, its history and cultures, and identify minority contributions that need to be shared. I hope your participation in the conference was enlightening, and I hope you have a great day. <laughs>